if the volatility is only going in one direction, you should be very cautious. And if you can't run the software to evaluate the blockchain yourself, uh, then it's almost certainly a scam. We've seen that with OneCoin, uh, which is a notorious scam that's had a lot of traction. And the funny thing is, these things are much better at marketing themselves than Bitcoin. That was Andreas Antonopoulos back in 2017. He's probably one of the most well-known Bitcoin evangelists talking briefly about OneCoin. In the past episode, episode 59, we had part one of this two-part series with Timothy Curry, aka Temptation, where we discussed kind of the basics of OneCoin, the outlandish claims that they were feeding people trying to steal their money, such as, you know, 10xing, 100xing your money, making millions of dollars with only thousands of dollars in investment, as well as just ridiculous claims that they were bigger than Apple and the largest company in history. In this next part of the series, we will be discussing more about Dr. Ruja and kind of the exposing of the new elements within this criminal conspiracy involving fraud, theft, tax evasion, a love triangle, and possibly even money laundering for organized crime. Before we get into the interview, I was wondering if you could do me a favor. Please listen to my sponsor, eToro, which you can go to at diginocrypto.com slash E-T-O-R-O, and you will get $50 for free to use to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin on eToro, a trusted smart trading platform offering some of the most innovative trading tools in all of Bitcoin. If you also could go and leave a five-star and a written review on iTunes, that would help immensely. And also go to supportmypodcast.com and click on the listener supporter button and you will get exclusive discounts for free. There's no gimmicks. There's no tricks. So head on over to supportmypodcast.com. That's supportmypodcast.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. There was a, another video that you sent, um, but you know when I ripped it, the audio just didn't quite do it justice. So it's it's better to kind of really watch it. Uh, so for for the the listeners, uh, I would recommend that they if they go to the show notes, if you watch the it'll be called like the the I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but the Joby Bowie almost reveals Bitcoin balance video. And someone asked him in one of his presentations, and this gentleman is in uh, is is in England, or it, it sounded like the crowd was English as well. And someone asked him to demonstrate a a, a transaction, but of course he, yeah, but he can't demonstrate one because with the coin that he's actually peddling. Uh, but he uses his phone to demonstrate a Bitcoin transaction. Someone in the audience that also had a software wallet on their phone, and as he's kind of you know. Uh, Getting into the to the app, he can't constantly, you know, shows it, uh, flips it back over to show the audience what he's doing, and doing the step by step. And he quickly pulls it back since he almost revealed, or I guess to maybe somebody in the front row, his actual Bitcoin balance. And this was so revealing to me because if you really believed in one coin is the next Bitcoin, and you believed everything that you're selling in these presentations, why would you ever hold Bitcoin? Um, it, or a balance definitely that you didn't want to show. And also, if you even understood anything about, you know, cryptocurrency, why would you hold so much in a software wallet that you wouldn't even want to, that you're worried about revealing it? You know, that's kind of like week three to week six, kind of, I've got, just got into Bitcoin sort of stuff. Right. Yeah, Joby Bowie was a big promoter. There's a few people uh, who would constantly make weekly videos because if you may, or even daily videos in some cases. And because if you were do leading these webinars or doing these presentations and basically t talking about a bunch of nonsense, but splicing in the words one coin in there, then people subscribe to your channel. And so uh, Joby was one of these people who was uh, doing uh, uh, different videos uh very frequently and this guy was had just before he got into one coin was part of uh, a company called ufund or utoken and that previous year 
uh, actually, no, it wasn't even then. He, he had got into OneCoin after UFUN and UToken. But right around that time, Thailand had actually captured uh, 22 of the uh, top UFUN and UToken Ponzi scheme uh, promoters in that country and had sentenced them to 12,000 years in prison. Now, in Thailand, there are maximum prison terms, so I think that each individual would only serve about, say, 20 years or something like this. But the courts just threw the book at him, you know? And so he goes from this scam, which, by the way, the words, the verbiage, everything that he was, you know, talking about about OneCoin, he was saying eight months ago about Utopia. This is going to be the next cryptocurrency. You know, Bitcoin is, uh, you know, Bitcoin is controlled by the whales or is used. One of the things that that um, that uh, OneCoin and Ruja Ignatova and the top leaders would say is that, you know, Bitcoin is used for money laundering and for buying drugs and weapons on the dark net and, you know, stuff like this. And so that was another reason why you shouldn't use Bitcoin. Ruja in the early years, in fact, even said that uh, having any other cryptocurrency or working for any other company or being involved in any other project, such as Bitcoin, like you know, owning cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or whatever, was a breach of the uh, terms of service of IMAs, which stands for Internet. Uh, uh, independent marketing associates uh, contract agreements and they can have their coins frozen or uh, confiscated okay so Ruja said that you know doing so was like uh, working for coca-cola and then being caught you know uh, someone seeing you with a Pepsi in your hand drinking a Pepsi and so there was she was a ruthless bitch man everything she wanted every single last dollar of, of all these people she just wanted to bleed them dry but joby boy uh gets into uh what you know this is you know this he's presenting and trying to tell people that how great one coin is and then he uses a mycelium wallet to do a, a bitcoin transaction or whatever yeah and if you know, do i did a little bit of basic research into a lot of these names of people on these videos and the and kind of the top resellers uh in one coin and if you look at you know like you just talked about joby you know and and guys like the uh, uh you know mcmurrin and and those guys is that all of them were just jumping from one mlm to to another uh, you know and uh, th these guys have you know no integrity and and no morals but one coin itself was built on this perceived credibility and intelligence, uh, intelligence of one person. I should say, originally didn't even mention her, but then it really took off once they kind of built the product around her. You know, like you mentioned, she, she was claimed to have a 200 plus IQ. She went to these elite schools as a doctor. Although I believe that the doctor portion was kind of proven, at least that it was shown that she did it, uh, do the program uh, in the BBC series. I think that they kind of showed at least that part was was somewhat true, but she was definitely an intelligent and a ruthless woman, but it was crafted to be seen as kind of this beyond reproach mess messianic figure. And the, the next, yeah, and the, the next clip that we're going to hear is actually a released FBI wiretap. Um, and it shows a call that she had to her, uh, probably then, but maybe probably not now, married lover, Gil Armenta. And we could talk uh, more about him after the clip. But the full clip will be in the show notes. But basically, earlier in the... She's kind of complaining about him not leaving his wife for her, and she's been listening in on his calls and everything like that. And um, in this next clip, though, in that same conversation, uh, she talks about the you know integrity and the need for integrity. Yeah, this mind you, this is someone who's literally stolen about five billion dollars. Yeah, right. I know people are assholes. I know people can be weak. I know people can do a lot of things to get what they want or whatever. But I don't deserve this, and she does not deserve this. And whatever you think you are, and that you're smarter than anyone, it's not. You, you understand? It's just not. It's not cool. There's one thing that's called personal integrity. Google it. It might be good. I don't want her to be with a person who has no personal integrity and who is just like saying bad things behind my back. You understand? I'm sure you do. So good night to you. 
you know, and like you said, it's amazing that a woman who created, um, you know, who knows, might be the, the biggest Ponzi uh, in history or definitely one of the largest ones um, uh, that, that we've seen in recent years, kind of has these cojones to talk about how much she values uh, personal integrity. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. And uh, th I mean, this is a woman who, you know, faked a Forbes cover and said that, that, you know, she was on the cover of Forbes and the company promoted it as the cover of Forbes and that there was, she was interviewed by Forbes magazine and things like this. Uh, ended up being a second cover that was just an ad. Uh, she spoke at the uh, fourth annual Eastern European Summit uh, held by The Economist. Uh, uh, in the in the early years, which obviously you know they promoted the hell out of that, they uh, made a video of that event, and the way that she was able to do that was by taking stolen investors' monies and purchasing the title sponsorship, the platinum level sponsorship for that event, and uh, having a 15-minute stage time between 10:15 a.m. Uh, and 10:45 a.m. in like kind of a secondary room at this you know huge event conference that had you know presidents and uh, dignitaries from around the world, uh, and so she placed herself into these situations where she just seemed successful by association, and she seemed legitimate by association, um, and there was a a, a, a a newspaper out of Norway called. Afton Posten, which means the afternoon. And the article, this is a couple of years later, um, the article actually went to one of the marketing directors at The Economist and tried to evoke some response about that whole event and you know what took place. Well, apparently The Economist, after that event, completely had to rethink their policies and uh, you know you could not just pay for a uh, speak, speaking engagement out there. That was a huge embarrassment for the Economist. And in fact, the Economist eliminated that entire event from their website. They just erased it. And this whole thing, like all, all this stuff that she does, like it's and, and that that speaking portion. I mean, she's not trying to get you know, like all these dignitaries and, and people of, of, you know, quote unquote, uh, high status or respect to buy into one coin. I mean, this is all just this crafted image so they can show her speaking pan outs to, um, you know, uh, to the people in the audience are saying that, you know, so-and-so was, was, was at this conference at the same time that she was, you know, and, and it's all for selling to, you know, people uh you know average joes out there that are getting resold on this so that they're seeing in their facebook feed that you know dr ruja this 200 iq now she's speaking in front of ambassadors and presidents and you know so and so and you know it's just this very it's it's impressive i mean i hate to use that word but it's very impressive the way that they built up this cult of personality around her to to sell this product to people because it's not about converting a nation state over to one coin it's about getting the guy who's got 10 grand saved up in the bank to fork over you know 500 bucks then two grand and then the other 7500 that he's got in there absolutely and she was somewhat of a magician she was walking she by the way she only did maybe maybe four or five big events uh, a year and that might have even been at the prime of one coins uh uh you know burglary or whatever in 2016 maybe she did yeah four to six events um after that maybe two or three uh in 2016 i think she did one or two events so she was just this like you said this uh this you know great you know gift of god to mankind that didn't even have to show up uh in order to evoke these kinds of responses you know maybe she would have a photo shoot once every couple months and then you know steal 
steal some, uh, you know, quote from Andreas Antonopoulos and manipulate it around and, uh, and then put it on this, you know, marketing propaganda and people would share that hell out of it all over social media and think that she was just so great. She was literally walking around the entire time when she was on stage with her hand in a cookie jar and the people that were in the audience were under such bliss, mesmerization, and uh, just uh, had really the, the you know, cloak thrown over their eyes that they didn't recognize the cookie jar. And she knew it. And if you study her, uh, her just kind of mannerisms on stage and the way that she went about, there were times that you could tell that she was like, how the hell am I pulling this off right now? Are people going to believe what I'm about to say? And she would say it and deliver, you know, whatever bomb, you know, passage or uh, message that, you know, she was going to try to drop at that moment. And just the people went wild. And, and you know, from someone in, in crypto or, or even someone that, that had the most basic understanding of economics and things like this, you know, watching this stuff, I mean, your mouth, your, your chin is on the floor. You're just like, oh my God. I remember like looking at some of these videos because I was mesmerized. And, and I, I, for the first, you know, several weeks after, uh, after I'd been introduced to it, like I said, I didn't pay it much mind. And then I just saw it popping up more and more. And then all of a sudden there was in May, this event, uh, in Dubai called Gold Rush. It was in 20, in May of 2015. And she was on this, in this massive theater. There's like 3000 people there. And behind her is a, is the biggest, you know, movie screen I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, that's just massive stories high, you know, the, the length from, you know, side to side from wall to wall was like the length of a football field with her image and, you know, cast upon this, uh, upon this screen behind her. And so, um, people absolutely idolized her and thought she could do no wrong. And so, you know, people like me, um, and some of the others who were calling out this stuff, you know, we were quickly dismissed, quickly blocked, uh, and that was infuriating because, you know, we would gain access to say a, a, some one coin group or something like this. And, and, and we're thinking, you know what, I mean, if these people understood, what if these people were this passionate about real cryptocurrency, real blockchain, a, they're not going to lose their life savings, B, they're going to learn about the technology, but that wasn't the case. And, and just the blatant theft that was happening in broad daylight and watching that and, and witnessing all of her minions and uh, lieutenants that were carrying out these, these duties in these, this massive sweep of money back to these you know, headquarters where uh, Constantine, her brother in court last week described, he said that there was a safe in the Bulgaria office in Sofia on the third floor. And, uh, the safe he described as a, as a small room. And I can guarantee you that that small room was filled to the top with money uh, at, at many particular times. They had a apartment in Hong Kong, which they used just as a money house. And on two separate occasions that were, just, that were uh, touched on in the court case, uh, Sebastian Greenwood, after he had left the company in I think December of 2018 had, uh, or no, in 2017, he, he left the company and disappeared. And like all these leaders, like they disappear. Right. But at some point he had went to the, went to that, that apartment and stole a hundred million dollars. And then another, uh, Chinese leader or Chinese, you know, member of one coin or something like this, some affiliate of one coin went to that, uh, to that apartment and stole a hundred million dollars. How the hell do you steal $100 million? That's, I mean, this, this place must have, been, must have had so much money in it. And this is all, all cash because they've lost all their bank accounts for a long time. They've lost, you know, t more than two dozen bank accounts. And so uh, the way that, uh, that this was be fun being funded was primarily uh, through 
another pyramid-like network where uh, where checks would be carried up the top and then uh, those people would cash the checks and send them to their upline. They would send them to their upline. They'd send them to their upline. And now you have suitcases and, and entire vans and uh, apartments and, you know, rooms that they call safes uh, filled to the top with, with money from around the world. Just, just astonishing the level of, of theft this was. And actually, if we could go back just a little bit, uh, so the the guy that she's on the call with in the clip that we just heard and another one that we'll hear in a little bit, uh, uh, Gil Armenta, uh, can you give a little background on who he was? Um, obviously, he's in a relationship with, with Ruja, but uh, who exactly is he in the organization and or, you know, what what is his kind of background? Right. So there's a lot of interesting things coming out in the trials right now. So the FBI has been investigating OneCoin for at least three years now. And that seems like such a mighty long time to, you know, try to take down one of these scams. And we'll, we'll get into the complexity of that in a little bit. But Gil Armenta was a name that I had never heard. Mark Scott who's on trial right now was another name that I had never heard, you know, before that. And, and you know, myself and, uh, and some of the people that I work with on, uh, on exposing this and have for the past five years, you know, we know this company inside and out, but these were the guys that were behind the scene. And uh, Konstantin Ignatov, Ruzha's uh, brother, testified in court last week that, uh, that Gil Armenta was introduced to him once by Ruja, and he was introduced as, quote, one of our international money launderers. And Ruja, by the way, is married to uh, someone by the name of Strell, or Bjorn Strell, Bjorn Strell. And, and actually, I'm not even <laughs> that comfortable talking about some of these names, because when you get uh, to this level, some of these names are end up being some pretty dangerous people. Uh, but yeah, so this guy was an international money launderer and uh, was was facilitating some of this money laundering through Mark Scott, who's on trial, who's facing uh, 50 years in prison. Uh, that's a 20, up to 20 year sentence for wire fraud or up to a 20 year sentence for money laundering. Um, and up to 30 year sentence for bank fraud. So he's, he lied to the banks, he knew what was going on, and the US uh, district attorney's offices uh, are proving that uh, live as we speak on a daily basis at this point uh, in court uh, in New York. So uh, Armenta was married, and so was Ruja, uh, and she ended up moving into the apartment underneath him, I believe it was in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, because she was jealous of the fact that he still had a wife. <laughs> and so while she's living there at, uh, you know, underneath Gil Armenta, you know, in, in, she's Bulgarian, right? And so this lady is a gypsy, and I don't say that like a, you know, a derogatory term really or anything like this, but she drills a hole in the in the in the ceiling of her apartment, in order to listen in to uh, to this Gil Armenta's conversations, right? And she's trying to spy and find out what's going on with him and his wife, and you know what I mean. And that's kind of what why she was pissed off in that other call is you know she kind of had found some of this stuff out. Well, what she was about to learn uh, just before she disappeared, which was in October of 2017 is that uh, because this Gil Armenta had a, had a couple of issues with, uh, with the law and with you know, uh, money laundering in the past uh, here in the US, uh, the FBI was, were able to contact him and bring him uh, into, uh, basically he turned into an informant. It's like, hey, look, you're either an informant or you're gonna have to uh, deal with uh, what else we're gonna charge you with. You know, kind of like, that's, that's how some of these scams are taken down. So she drills a hole in the apartment, here's this stuff, about you know him and his wife starts accusing him of uh, you know of, of of not having any integrity while while at the same time having stole five billion dollars, and then finds out he's an informant. So this I, I think you were maybe leading up to uh, to this last uh, this last clip here or 
or did you want to save that for maybe a little bit later? Uh, no, no, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll listen to this clip and yeah, what's just because uh, that that'll kind of roll into the next subject conversation here. And Gilbert, we can get access to your emails within 24 hours if we want to. You cannot prevent this shit. You have to be fucking careful. What these Russian guys can do, you cannot imagine. And if they can do it, everybody can do it. Yeah. The only advice that you get from me, do not use emails. Do not like Just face-to-face -face or encrypted phones. Nothing else is safe. Just believe me. Please. Like okay. I can get everything I want within 24 hours. And if I can, they can too. <sighs> I'm really worried. You have to be careful with communication. Everybody has to be careful with communication, like extremely. And uh, for those of you who may have uh, had a little bit of a hard time hearing, I think probably what was the most important part of that call was a, a bit garbled. And she said that what these Russian guys can do, you cannot imagine. And, you know, to me, and we kind of talked about this a little bit offline, was that uh, I think this kind of opens up the next page of of this story that that may not have uh, that hasn't come to light yet but may you know we may see as these uh, trials and everything keep on keep on moving along and i don't know if you if you agree with me on this but my thoughts are is that one coin was not just a massive scam but was probably involved in laundering money for some of the the, the worst folks that you can imagine organized crime and all that kind of stuff and just looking at their way that they would my thoughts on how they would do that is just you set up a clean front man, act as an MLM reseller, and they funnel money through a fake network of fake buyers below them. They send it to OneCoin, and then OneCoin could just send them back like a 70% um, referral bonus, you know, much higher than, than all the other guys were getting. And then they have that clean cash, and clean meaning that it, uh, it comes from a source that's that's viewed as legitimate, if you want to call it that. So if you had a million selling drugs, you just deposit that in the bank. Uh, you can't just deposit that into a bank because, you know, people start asking questions where this million dollars come from because this is just Joe Schmo who's got a, you know, a, a record, you know, a mile long. And then this way they can wash it through one coin. And it's about, you know, a standard 30% fee usually in, the, in these types of situations for money laundering. And one coin gets that 30% <clears throat> and they get clean money on the, on the back end. They can use that to buy, uh, you know, whatever that they want to or hold on to it because it's all clean. It comes from a quote unquote legitimate source. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on, you know, my theory of, of this connection. Cause we have heard a little bit. We heard that allusions to the, the, the quote unquote, the Russian guys, Rouge's brother, Constantine, um, who was CEO very briefly after she disappeared, you know, he's testified in court that he had, you know, some violent run-ins on the street with a with hell's angels biker gang basically putting a gun in his ribs kind of worrying about what was going on Gun in his mouth oh gun in his mouth wow yep. okay and broke his in an, on another occasion they took him took him uh kidnapped him and took him uh out to the countryside and broke his finger and basically said next time they're going to break something else if you know he didn't do what they did so yeah this is i mean they they moved a, t a hell of a lot of money and in order to do that on a uh, on a international level, you know, you have to you have to buy access. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna come into say Colombia and start ripping off people in Colombia, then maybe they're not going to be able to buy as much co you know cocaine or I mean, not that Colombia is an exporter of cocaine. But what I'm saying is is if if somewhere if someone is going to come into certain countries like Vietnam, like Thailand, like, uh, like, you know, countries in Central and South America, and Italy and things like that, that do have, you know, mobs and uh, Romania, Bulgaria itself, I mean, you know, all the politicians in Bulgaria know each other. And everyone knows what everyone's doing. And, and, you know, it's, 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 it's really scary. So this, uh, there's a, a a reporter out of Sofia named Nikolai Stoyanov, who began, uh, who works for the capital.bg in, in Sofia, which is uh, capital with a K.bg, um, K P A I T O L, uh, who's done a number of stories since 2015. And in one of those uh, stories, I think in 2016, he was able to kind of put together uh, some of the companies and registrations and, and whatnot that had been recorded because, you know, uh, at one point, uh, the FBI said that 
uh, that uh, OneCoin was using in 2016 at least 216 shell companies in 26 countries. Um, so that's a you know the more that you can dilute that money and deposit small amounts, uh, the more legitimate it looks, the less eyebrows that it raises. So in one of Nikolai's reports, he had this uh, this uh, graph thing put together that kind of linked uh, some of these different countries, companies rather that were that were tied to OneCoin, OneCoin's parent companies, uh, et cetera. And and one of the uh, main or one of the players that was that was linked to those companies was a, a guy by the name of Christophorus Taki Amanatidas. Taki was his nickname, but he was also called the Cocaine King. And he was one of the biggest drug runners in Romania and Bulgaria. I think he was Greek. Uh, some of this information uh, actually actually the the fact that that he ran the security for Ruja at one point did come out also in the in the court case uh, most recently in the past you know week and a half and so you know these guys are running with 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 some gnarly people on the underground so it's kind of like uh, I think you were gonna say uh, in terms of Wizard of Oz right I think you were gonna use that uh, the, the people behind the curtain or whatever um, so yeah so th so that so that gets pretty scary and, and some of these people who are being named now in court uh, are really really gnarly people in politics one has previously worked for the CIA and now is a uh, you know is 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 uh, he's a Russian that was working for the CIA that now is allegedly just uh, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go in a different direction <laughs> on this because, uh, you know, I have, I, I have uh, had some messages that were uncomfortable messages that, uh, caused me a little bit of pause to, uh, go into certain depths of what, uh, of where this, you know, what, what this company is. But, uh, to summarize, when you're operating something this big, I think that it works similar to how massive drug cartels work you got to be able to have these connections to move cocaine from Colombia into Los Angeles into Miami into New York uh, into London into different places all around the world and in order to do so you're either buying people off greasing the palms of authorities uh, you know people have to turn their heads in order to allow something this big this impactful uh, with such financial consequence to take place under their watch. And so who knows what percentage even of all of the stolen funds was used or budgeted for greasing palms, paying people off and, and things like this. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's some heavy shit. And I hope that more of that will also come out this week and for the next uh, week after that, uh, when as the FBI is uh, testifying uh, against Mark Scott, uh, and maybe Constantine will come back up and testify some more. Who knows? But uh, but yeah, heavy heavy shit. Yeah, and and on the the flip side of that, we, you were talking uh, briefly about the FBI having a uh, investigating them for about three years and. You know yourself, uh, along with people like Crypto Expose and uh, one Delphi, uh, whose YouTube, yeah, his, his uh, I'll, I'll link to their YouTube channels in the show notes as well, and a shout out to them for for doing great work. Um, you know, you guys were working, you know, for years and years to expose this for what it was, um, and a lot of people in, you know, the. You know, a lot of a lot of people in Bitcoin and the wider communities, they they seem there seem to be very uh, little interest or attempts to kind of um, uh, from a, from a lot of people. But it, it seemed like all the real kind of public uh, kind of attempts to sway people from getting caught up in this were from guys like yourself and kind of people, uh, a small group of people within the the crypto community, um, and on the surface, seemed to be little interest or attempts to kind of rein this in from law enforcement. But you said that there had been an investigation uh, um, 
for for years and i was wondering you know i know that you can't discuss everything perhaps but i was wondering if if you could kind of give an overview of what different law enforcement um actions had been taken throughout the years if at all and what's what's basically currently going um a course of trials but uh if you if you know that there's uh you know larger uh investigations now that now that's more public sure absolutely so i think a good a good uh a good intro to this would be the fact of how one coin actually grew so big so quickly so in late 2015 and early 2016 what onecoin's strategy was was to buy and partner with collapsed scams and this is where some of the top leaders came from so for instance in 2016 or maybe it was 2015 i forget but uh there was a a, a ponzi scam that was run by the Steinkeller brothers, uh, Aaron, Ste uh, Stefan, and Christian Steinkeller. It was called Con Ligus, C O N L I G U S. And they had tens of thousands of members, uh, you know, mainly in like uh, South America, for instance. And so when this Ponzi scheme collapsed, uh, one coin, and Ruja in particular, she was a great negotiator, contacted the Steinkeller brothers. I'm presuming this is exactly how it went and it couldn't have gone that much different, but contacted the Steinkeller brothers and said, Let, listen, uh, you guys have been great at building this, uh, you know, this, this Ponzi scam, this Conligus, uh, you know, for the last several months, you've made excellent money for yourselves. I wanna bring you in here and uh, for you to do the same. So I'll tell you what, I'll take these, you know, tens of thousands of uh, members that you have in your database, and uh, I'll pay you uh, 1 million dollars to 1 million euros to be a part of our team and part of our leaders. And uh, we're gonna take those databases, we're gonna send out emails and invite them into one coin and say, listen, I know you all lost money in Conligus, but this is really gonna, Get you that money back and it's really going to be worth it so they did this with conligus there was another uh scam uh called univertine which was also central in south america it was run by a serial scammer named alexander Ar aranalis uh they had about 120,000 members estimated uh we had a, a, a combination of scams which uh, Sebastian Greenwood, the co-founder, was involved in, Frank Ricketts, Christian Goebel, and several others, Kenny Nordland, uh, John Ng, who was uh, the founder of Bigcoin, which was the precursor to OneCoin and what OneCoin was modeled on, and their scam was called Unico. Unico uh, was a part of a merger of a social media network Ponzi scheme called Site Talk, which was uh, something that uh, Sebastian Greenwood spent a lot of time building. And these had also worked with, merged with something who another big leader in OneCoin, Frank Ricketts, had, uh, had put together called OPN, which was Opportunity Network. So Unico, Site Talk, and OPN uh, Network had over 400,000 members estimated, right? Uh, there was another scam called uh, BNG International. That had tens of thousands of members. That was uh, done by a serial scammer named John Mursucci. Uh, and finally, there was another collapsed Ponzi scam called Bonifa. Bonifa had about 60,000 members. Now, Bonifa had actually collapsed at the beginning of 2016. And in April of 2016, the three heads the three leaders of bonifa were on the front page of uh the uk times or whatever it was in handcuffs getting arrested for perpetrating a hundred million dollar ponzi scheme right now that's big money i mean you steal 10 million dollars that's a lot of money but you steal a hundred million dollars that's an insane amount of money now what the facts around the takedown of bonifa were is it took two and a half years, it took 1,200 uh, officers that were working together through Interpol, through Europol, around the world, across borders. It took 126 or 120 uh, 
uh, court ordered subpoenas in order to get access to the information of the three of the top scanner, scammers of Bonifa in order to finally uh, you know, pull the trigger and arrest those bastards for stealing a hundred million dollars and take them to court and send them to prison. But Bonifa, BNG International, uh, Unico, Site Talk, OPN, uh, Univer Team, Conligus, there's almost a dozen scams that combined underneath one coin right there. And these are all, you know, a number of months apart. And what the pitch was to these guys is look, if you bring on uh, two tycoon packages at 5,000 euros a piece, then we'll pay you back all of your losses that you lost in Conligus, in, uh, 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 you know, these, in these different scams. But here's the catch. That money was going to be paid back in one coins. You lost ten thousand dollars. We'll pay you back ten thousand dollars in one coins. So essentially, this money that they're creating out of thin air, it's worthless. They create it at a rate that's ridiculous. In fact, if you do the math, during from from the beginning of 2015, in January of 2015 through October 1st of 2016. Uh, one coins were created at a rate of 10,000 every 10 minutes, okay? So on the blockchain number one, 10,000 coins a minute from January 12th of 2015 to October 1st of 2016 was 1.986500 million, billion, yes, billion uh, one coins. So one, basically almost 2 billion one coins. And uh, then on October 1st, they instituted this quote unquote new blockchain. And on this new blockchain, that's when it was 50,000 uh, new coins a minute. Now, during this entire time, uh, whereas you look at coin market cap and you look to the right and you see how, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and these other coins are fluctuating and one's up, you know, 0.02% and one's down 3% and the other one's, you know, up two and a half percent or whatever. Um, as Bjorn described it, one coin's uh, market chart just looks like a set of stairs. And so at today's rate, which is 29.85 euros, with the amount of fake coins that have been mined, which is over 70 billion coins now, we're talking about a quote unquote market capitalization of over almost between 2.1 and 2.4 trillion dollars with a T, trillion dollars. So the United States federal government prints about, or rather there, according to the Federal Reserve, there's about 1.67 trillion paper dollars in circulation. That is actually including coins as well. And according to one coin claims, there's over 2.1 trillion dollars uh, in one coin so one coin right now is worth more than all the american dollars in circulation around the world at this given point of time but these victims of one coin that's what they don't get is they they can't get math um but that's the only way to try to break through this so reel me back in here yeah, no, no, I, I, uh, I think it's it's really enlightening to kind of, you know, go through this because it's, the the, you know, all this stuff makes sense. So you know, a lot of us were drawn into Bitcoin, um, because we, you know, economic reasons or whatever it may be. You know, especially kind of earlier on, right? We realized that there was a problem with this kind of idea of or, you know just endless printing of money, which destroys the value of the money that you already have that there's set targets to actually devalue your money and i i can't remember if we already mentioned it but there was that that um, there was that meeting at one coin where ruja um had i believe it was ruja was uh, doing the the uh, speaking where they were talking about how well you know there's so much interest but we're actually running out of coins so they're going to increase they're going to double the supply and double everybody's holdings um of, of coins as well that were there and everybody cheered 
um, that was there because they thought this was a wonderful thing. I've just doubled my wealth without really understanding that if one coin actually was subject to market forces, if you just double your money supply overnight, you don't double your wealth. You you have twice as many coins and, and at best have half the value. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So, so here's the story on that. Okay. So in 2016, by 2016, one coin was really taking off in March of 2016, it was nearing 30% of the fixed and finite supply of 2.1 billion coins. Okay. So Bitcoin has 21 million. One coin just multiplied it by hundred because you know, uh, why the hell not? And so one coin marketing material from 2014 and 2015 and 2016 up until, uh, up until June said that there were a fixed and finite number and it in fact used that uh, exact verbiage of 2.1 billion coins. And one coin had always promised that when 30% of the coins were mined, that, uh, that, uh, that, mer that there were 50,000 merchants waiting to come aboard. And some leaders said there was 50,000. Some people said there was 75. One, you know, one of the leaders said there was 500,000 merchants waiting to come aboard. Let's just take, and, and, and this one character, this idiot out of Canada, his name's Ken Labine. And he's one of these guys that literally did a podcast, uh, not a podcast, uh, uh, a presentation a day. And all he would do is talk to himself and just spit soliloquies. And, and he was so stupid. And at first I tried, you know, I recognized that this guy was having an impact and he had followers. And so I tried to be nice to him. I actually went uh, and we had some debates. And at first we were friendly. Um, and I just spoke logic and how cryptocurrency work and how math worked and things like this. And, uh, you know, we ended up, uh, because he was so st stubborn and, and so willing to uh, sweep major government warnings, arrests, and, uh, and just the propaganda that was pro proven to be propaganda, just sweep it under the rug and just keep on going and keep on promoting like, like nothing ever happened. Uh, you know, we definitely uh, didn't end on a good note. Um, but in the early days, I would get on his program on his, uh, you know, we would do a, a debate and, you know, we debated online a few times and offline many times. And, uh, and anyhow, so leading up to, so when, when, if, when April 16th came, 30% of the coins were mined in January, he was saying, as soon as 30% of the coins are mined, we're going to be able to buy new watches, Ferraris, uh, do, you know, doctor's visits, what, whatever we want, everything that we want will be, you know, I'm either going to have uh, sand in my toes or egg on my, egg on my face is what he would say. And that was in January. And of course, by April 16th, there was nothing. And so between April 16th uh, and, Ju and June 11th, June 11th was supposed to be this big uh, Wembley Arena event in, in London, right? And Wembley Arena is a massive arena. It's huge, right? And so there's April, there's May, and then there's June. So there's almost two months between when 30% of the coins were mined and 50,000 50, merchants were supposed to all of a sudden magically come aboard to, I don't know where they were coming from, but as soon as they're mined, then there's 50,000 merchants. You know, this is the kind of logic that, uh, that we dealt with and found so ridiculous um, early on. So during this time, there was just dead air, dead air. It's, it's like if, if you and I just stopped talking for like five minutes and you can expected people to have still, uh, you know, li be listening to this podcast. Um, so during this dead air time, one of, the, one of the leaders at the top thought it would be a wise idea to push out some propaganda, so he did. And he said, uh, and it said, uh, Alibaba is coming aboard. At Alibaba will take one coin. It had Alibaba's logo and it had uh, one coin's logo. And, it, and, it, and then uh, when, once that just spread like, you know, like cancer across the entire, you know, social media groups and Facebooks and all this stuff, you know, then they said, hey, you guys weren't supposed to leak that information. That might compromise the deal and partnership and all this stuff. And that was supposed to be private information and someone leaked it. And, you know, so, but it was leading up to this event. And during that event, 
uh, I think there were maybe about 8,000 people at that arena. Uh, in court the other day, they said three, but I think it was uh, closer to 5,000 or 8,000. And so this event kicks off and everyone's, you know, in suits and is in this big arena and there's freaking fireworks going off inside and the amps are turned to 11 and you know Ruja and all these scammers are on stage talking about how much money they've made and how much money everyone's going to make and and all this sort of stuff and she says you know what guys uh we're running out of coins we're running out of coins for india we're running out of coins for africa and we're running out of coins for merchants and i'm like okay uh for one, you're running out of coins for Africa, you're running out of coins for India. That's a little bit ridiculous, but when you say you're running out of coins for merchants, doesn't that imply that if a merchant starts selling stuff and comes aboard and starts selling stuff, that you're giving the merchant these coins? What's, what's going on? Because to me, if someone's selling a good or service, then I take the money that I got out of my wallet and I say, hey, I'm going to trade you these, the money that I have in my wallet for goods and service. Not, it's not like someone else from some higher up comes down, you know, through a cloud and says, oh, you're selling something? You have a lemonade stand? Let me give you all these one coins because you're... So there were, there were blatant things that stuck out. So during this event, which was, by the way, one of the most well-produced events you could possibly imagine, Ruja's in this, you know elegant crazy red dress with her black hair and her big red lipstick and on this huge stage she comes out and all of a sudden on the massive screen behind her it says she's all yes one coin uh, i've been has been called a lot of things but the one i like is the bitcoin killer and then that's when it started that's when like the oh man you bitch and, <laughs> and so this big screen says one coin bitcoin killer on it and stuff right and then she says uh so there's not enough coins. So what we're going to do is we're going to change it to 120 billion coins. Now, we're going from 2.1 billion. And by the way, Bitcoin doesn't need 2.1 billion because it's divisible to the eighth decimal point. And uh, if we uh, needed more coins, then we could simply do a soft fork and make it divisible to the tenth de decimal point. And then we have 100 times more uh, bitcoins that can be circulated without devaluing the currency, right? But with, with Ruja, no. I'm going to multiply the supply by 5,700% and people are hanging on, but I'm going to double your coins. And everyone's all, woo! Oh my God, yes, yes, yes. And watching this, we're like, oh my God, she just increased the supply by 57 times she doubled the coins if the whatever the price was right at that point in time i don't know if it was seven euros or something like that it would have made the price like 25 cents no 12 and a half cents but if it was doubled then maybe 25 cents a coin so you would have lost 96 and a half percent of your value at least just based on that hyperinflation at that given moment as she described it now the hyperinflation itself took place a few months later on October 1st. She said that this is the only time I'm going to ever do it. Um, so during that event on October 1st, I remember it was uh, in Bangkok, and I think it was a Saturday night. So I had to work that night. And uh, uh, it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on, uh, is when it started, I believe, and which was, I think, midnight my time. It was maybe 16 hours difference or something like this. But anyhow, um, so I got to uh i got home and i'm like you know 11 o'clock or whatever i'm like okay this thing's gonna start at midnight and they were gonna live stream it and all this stuff and they had like you know almost they claimed that they had uh 10 or twelve thousand people there they did have eight thousand at that event and i had someone that i knew was there that had a um had a drone that was anyways that's a big long story there's all kinds of interesting cool side stories that we could go down but during that event she's standing in front of this giant uh screen that uh, is, you know, counting down to this new blockchain, right? And so there's a counter that's counting down. And remember, now every one minute, there's going to be 50,000 new coins. Every, you know, when it counts down on the minute, at the minute, 
all of a sudden 15,000 coins are produced. So in terms of mining, which by the way, she had always said it was a proof of work uh, mining mechanism, then you know that it can't be that accurate. You know, with Bitcoin, we have a 10, 10 minute blocks, right? But what that is, is the average block takes about 10 minutes uh, to solve because it's recalculated every 2,106 blocks or 2,116 blocks, I forget, 2,060, I don't know, whatever. Um, and it's recalibrated to for the difficulty to average that time. But what that means is that if on average it's 10 minutes, some minutes it's gonna, some some blocks are going to take 15 minutes, some are going to take take 20 minutes. There's blocks that'll take an hour, and there's blocks that'll take five seconds, and that's just how it is. But with one coin, it was every minute on the minute these these new things. But on stage, she's pointing to this big thing that's showing this countdown and showing the last blocks and showing you know this new blockchain that's about to start and all this. And dude, this was a looping video from Shutterstock that she was passing off as the OneCoin blockchain. And there's a, um, a, a website out of Finland, and Finland, yeah, that's called Muro BBS, M-U-R-R-O-B-B-S. And this is a, a, a bulletin board that, uh, that a lot of the Finns and Swedes where OneCoin actually first took off because that's where some of the uh, top early leaders were from and uh some of these guys that were on the muro board boards uh that were into crypto or not into crypto recognized that you know this was a scam early on they saw a lot of their family members uh uh, uh investing in stuff and so they started commenting on it and so a lot of the information that i was gleaning in the early years was was coming from that site and, and coming from around the world i mean i got fluent in Google Translate, I mean, and in the idiosyncrasies between different languages, and you know, I watched Google get better in how to translate, you know, Norwegian or Dutch or you know, all these things over the years. So it's been like a really, really interesting experience. And so I'm on this uh, this website watching this live, and I'm like, guys, this is a looping video from Shutterstock, and I send the link and. In, in the YouTube video in the live feed, the it, you know pops up. It shows it's a a, a looping video. I'm gonna look at this. Click this. It's a looping video. It's <laughs> dude. I felt like it was like the Twilight Zone, and you're like to serve man. It's a cookbook. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I'll digress with that. No, I I think that you know that's a a good way to 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 end this this uh, chapter of of my my series on on one coin um and there's going to be more coming in the future as well but you know it's it, it i think it shows just you know the the problem in this space that we have where it's really difficult for the average person to tell uh, who's not in bitcoin or in this space in general the difference between you know what a proof of work algorithm is versus proof of stake or or just an outright scam or that you know that if I showed my my parents uh, a screenshot of me doing a, a Bitcoin transaction, you know, verifying it, showing it on my node that it's you know been confirmed on the blockchain, all that kind of good stuff, and that video, they probably wouldn't have much. They they wouldn't be able to probably tell the difference. And I think that's, you know, there's going to be more people to continue. Anytime you have something new, um, especially something that has wealth attached to it. Uh, or promises uh, of it is you're just going to continue to have these people. And I think it's really good going forward that, that people, you know, listen um, to this moment that, you know, yourself and Bjorn um, and others are, are having in bringing this to light because, you know, maybe not even has to do with crypto, but uh, you know, just the average scams that people run. I just got a letter in the mail running a very, very old scam that's been around since email was invented or probably soon after of I've got a inheritance coming. And now it's actually coming in physical mail form, uh, probably because people trust that more. But there's always going to be people who are going to try to separate you and your money by promising you things. But, um, you know, I'd, I really, you know, like to thank you for for doing this and also for taking years of your life, uh, you know, exposing uh, yourself to to you know, actual real physical risks and threats and, and uh, just, you know, time spent exposing the scam. 
uh, as well for you know coming on the show but you know how can people stay updated on the case against one coin and um what are you up to and how can people get a hold of you as well yeah absolutely so so i'll i want to i'll give you my uh give the audience rather my uh contact information how to follow me and i also have one more uh pretty funny story that i could throw in there uh, one more piece of information, and if I could kind of thank some of the people that have helped along the way, that would be great. So you can follow me at Twitter at either Temptation, that's T-I-M-T-A-Y-S-H-U-N, and that's been kind of a DJ name from way back in the day, not that I was ever a good DJ or anything like that, but uh, but I've gone by, my name's Timothy Curry. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at Timothy uh, Temptation Curry and temptation in parentheses or in quotes rather and on twitter at either uh temptation t-i-m-t-a-y-s-h-u-n or at uh, uh easy coin access both are the same account so the actual twitter handle is temptation and the and the little at sign is ez that's as in the letter e the letter zeta and then coin and then a-c-c-e-s-s ez coin access um that those are the best ways and and if you uh want to learn more about this uh then you can follow on my twitter some of the friends that have contributed greatly to this over the years one being crypto expose uh another being one coin insider and so one and you can find these people directly i like all their comments and, and retweet them and vice versa and another one is ari widell ari or a r i Wydell, W-I-D-E-L-L. Uh, he runs a blog called Scam Detector out of Sweden, and he has been really implement, instrumental in bringing a lot of attention to this and uh, really covering a lot of these stories very well. Uh, another uh, source that has really co- has written over 250, I think, articles on uh, on OneCoin since September 28th of 2014, covering the uh, missing bank accounts and everything else, is behind MLM. And uh, there's uh, they get a lot of crap because he doesn't uh, he doesn't really. Um, uh, basically network marketers hate him, but he's exposed so much fraud in the industry and just really needs a shout out. Um, so I definitely wanted to mention him, but yeah, crypto exposed, Ari Wydell, one coin insider, Oz Delphi. These are guys that you'll find on my tw- Twitter page. Terry Jarvanen is a uh, computer scientist and uh, an author, a uh, tech author out of, uh, out of Sweden or Finland. I, I don't remember. Kateri Jarvanen, but he's awesome. He's done such a great job. Um, before the kind of big break on this story that really saturated the media with Jamie and Georgia at BBC on the missing crypto queen, which is awesome. They did such a magnificent job. And when they were working with myself and Jim McAdams and, uh, and, uh, crypto expose as well as Oz, uh, as Bjorn Pjörk, um, we really conveyed to them that we wanted to put this message out in a certain way that that would be gripping, and they just masterfully and used so much art and and just orchestrated, you know, that eight part series super well. And by the way, it's still number one right now in UK on Apple iTunes. Um, so if anyone hasn't seen that, I mean, this is good stuff. I mean, the, the sound, the, the music, the, the story, they traveled from, uh, Bulgaria to Romania, to Germany, even to Uganda, covering this story, looking for the missing crypto queen. That was awesome. Um, you know, so let me get to this story. Okay. So in terms of Tom McMurrin, everybody has their, their favorite scammer, right? And we need to call out scammers. One thing I'm going to, I'm going to say as a disclaimer is if you are going to call out scammers, uh, do it under a pseudonym and create a fake profile if necessary. We are always, the haters are always have been, uh, you know, uh, always called haters and paid haters and bloggers and jealous Bitcoiners and all this stuff. Uh, as well as uh, pictureless profile pricks. That was a uh, PPP is a acronym that Ken Labine from Canada uh, invented, um, which stood for uh, pictureless profile pricks. He also called bloggers penny chasing parasites, PCPs. And um, the reason 
that I do recommend that, unless you have a fat bank account, is that scammers hate when you stop them from stealing money. And they will sue you. And they know that they will not win, but they'll sue you to make your life hell. And they'll sue you in order to, to occupy your time and, and do a bunch of this. So, it, so they'll call slander, they'll call libel, they'll call defamation, they'll call uh, obstruction of business or whatever. And uh, there's a number of us uh, that have been fighting this, that have had legal intimidations as well as threats of physical violence over the years and recently. Um, so just be careful. Definitely the community needs to stand up and needs to call these people out. Out. but uh, but do be kind of careful how you do it um, Tom McMurrin used to want run a show this is the convicted felon who spent seven years in prison for stealing from people uh, McMurrin ran a show uh, called the coin profit right the McMurrin was one of the few people that actually knew and understood at least the fundamentals of, of cryptocurrency and he would interweave a little bit about Bitcoin a little bit about ethereum and also talk about uh, one coin on his TV show, uh, The Coin Profit, that was on Grant Cardone TV. Well, he actually got so far as to interview Brock Pierce. And so when I come across this uh, interview with Brock Pierce and I see that he's, you know, with Tom McMurrin, I mean, poor guy, he's, you know, Andreas often uh, puts these disclaimers out. Andreas Amsonopoulos often puts these disclaimers out here. Just because I take a picture with you doesn't mean that I endorse you. Nobody has time to do due diligence on every single person they run across, shake hands with, or take pictures with. And I think it was definitely the same with Brock Pierce. But I got screen captures and a link for this show, The Coin Profit, in which uh, Tom McMurrin uh, interviewed Brock Pierce. And I'm all, Brock, dude, you're not going to let this guy do this. This guy's a big ass one coin scammer. And so Brock, essentially, I, I don't know what happened, but within about three days, that show was off the air and it never came back on. And so, you know, we we all, you know, me and Harry and Crypto Expose and, and a few others had, you know, sent out uh, uh, letters to Grant Cardone and, uh, you know, basically it was a, a combined effort and, and we torched that show pretty quick. So you got it. That's what we got to do, man. We, we got to we got to rid the rats, smoke the rats out of the holes, get them, get them out of here. Let them know that they can never be involved in this uh, industry uh, after these kinds of things. And so another quick shout out to uh, Maxime Grimbert from Street Press in France. He's the one that did the, he did a three part, a really, really good investigative three part series um, on OneCoin, uh, which kind of gave us a little bit of the fuel uh, to eventually uh, we get approached by uh, Jamie and George at BBC. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Jeff Rufino, who's uh, in, in Cairns, Australia, and he's been attacking the OneCoin scammers uh, over there, you know, contacting law enforcement and uh, the media to uh, crash their events and things like that. Uh, Tommy H. in Sweden is a, is a, is a guy who did get involved uh, early in one coin and pretty quickly figured out that it was a scam. Um, so he's been, you know, been researching and posting stuff. Susie in Scotland, uh, Melanie from Germany has been one of the most, uh, uh, active on behind MLM as far as posting and documenting, uh, screen captures and videos of specific scammers at all over the world that have uh, you know, been still promoting this scam. There's a guy named Sim John who uh, has been getting some really good uh, registration documents and filings and stuff like that. That's another good thing that Oz Delphi does is he has, you know, he's really good at sourcing uh, uh, business you know, documents and stuff like this. We have Lynn or Lindell from Eagle Research Group. He's, Eagle Research Group has been attacking Ponzi scams and pyramid schemes and, and uh, been a victim's right uh, nonprofit for the last 15 years. And so he's kind of guided us on how these work, how the Ponzi playbook works. We have Mehdi in Morocco. Morocco is a pretty uh, lawless country in some uh, in, in some respects, and unfortunately, in these uh, some of these types of countries, um, you know, these these people face serious serious threats. Medi has definitely faced some serious threats. We have Javier Saavedra, who's been taking a lot of our work and translating it into Spanish, 
uh, for the South, for the Mexico and Central and South American audience. His videos are doing great um, in that uh, he's spreading the messages and opening eyes and teaching people, uh, you know, what what these scams are are all about and how to avoid them. We have Daniel, who is uh, in the eighth uh, eighth episode of uh, of the missing crypto queen from Uganda. He's now making cryptocurrency or he's now making videos talking about cryptocurrency, talking about blockchain because he's been studying. Uh, having lost his money for one coin he warns people about one coin he warns people uh about these types of scams um so there's auto in finland otto that guy that guy is another brilliant brilliant guy and i know that i haven't mentioned everybody um but man there's just a lot of people that you know even more so recently john john walsh in uk that have come out, they've, they've done articles, they've done stories. Cointelegraph actually covered, uh, had some fantastic stories early on uh, about OneCoin. And uh, lastly, there's another Australian dude named Dave Worthington, who's uh, kind of attacked a lot of these Ponzi scams, uh, like USA Ta USI Tech, like uh, Zeke Rewards, like uh, some of the newer ones that are coming out. And these serial scammers, that are jumping from this scam are just going to the next one and taking them taking exactly what they learned from one coin and trying to build it up so we got to stop this man because the three reasons that i started uh, getting involved with this are these number one the hyper regulation scams like bitconnect and one coin are going to cause hyper regulation and have already caused hyper regulation in the u.s we can't participate in uh, icos anymore unless we're accredited investors you know there's certain coins that we can't tr trade on the exchange here and stuff like that that's bullshit and that's because of scams like these guys um number two number secondary reason is uh because of public perception you hear one coin you think bitcoin the public doesn't know cryptocurrency we have to teach them good examples of scams like this are just dirtying the name of crypto we have to stand up we have to do something we have to call these bastards out we got to smoke these rats out of the hole the number three reason is the human factor and that's because you know these these scams like one coin is going to leave a five billion maybe even 15 or more billion dollar trail of financial destruction behind it that's a lot of zeros behind that five and that's a lot of financial destruction and that's a lot of people whose lives are ruined who's there's going to be a lot of suicides over this man when anything gets into the billion dollar range as far as ponzi scams go which is very uncommon there's going to be suicides and so this is this is really sad so we really have to stand up for that. And lastly, lastly, the fourth reason that I began doing this came significantly later. And it's because as I realized that people were falling for this and that they were getting involved in this for the same reasons that, uh, that I had gotten involved in cryptocurrency, which was to bank the unbanked, to provide, you know, our own uh, uh, kind of, um, you know, decentralized, distributed, uh uh systems that would help give us independence from the banking cartels and you know big government and stuff like this um i just uh the the, the final reason and before i'm sorry i had a little ping thing going on in my ear there the final reason is because if these people who are passionate about this that are passionate about these scams for the right reasons get into real cryptocurrencies then man we can change the world and if we can call out the scammers and get them out of here then we can change the world if you don't stand up for for uh for justice then you're standing for the opposite reason and that's that's what i'll close with the largest class action lawsuit in, in network marketing history is now uh getting put together uh, against one coin and uh and its top leaders uh and they're suing for you know they're trying to recoup some of that some of the those billions of dollars that were stolen so we'll have to keep uh we'll have to keep on top of of that and thanks everybody for listening i feel like i sometimes get excited and start babbling but uh but uh thanks for giving me the, the platform no you guys have all been doing some really great work and I i'm gonna be uh, putting all the videos, articles, contact information, everything like that uh, in the show notes at digitalcrypto.com slash EP59. And Tim, thanks again. 
And that concludes the end of our two-part series with Tim Curry, a.k.a. Temptation on exposing the OneCoin scam. I want to thank you guys for listening, and we will be updating and continuing to do episodes of this podcast as more information comes to light on the OneCoin fraud. So if you guys could do me a quick favor, head over to iTunes, leave a five-star and written review, or head over to supportmypodcast.com to find all the ways you can support the podcast. But also if you click on the listener discount program button there, you can get access to discounts available only for listeners, absolutely free. There is a mailing list, but you don't actually have to sign up for it if you don't want to. We only use it to let you know about new products and contact you about new things that we're going to be doing in the program. So head on over there. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys listening. If you're watching on YouTube, just please subscribe there below and hit that bell button to get notifications every time a new episode goes live. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next week.